It's a hard job indeed, but it's also a, a lot of fun uh, because like, all the papers are super rich empirically and I have um, a good role, I think, which consists of like just throwing challenges without having to solve them. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty comfortable. So um, don't be surprised if I throw challenges, um, but, but I hope this is going to be useful. And in any case, I, I've been like um, amazed by the... Um, um, uh, amount of data that uh, you all have and, 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 and how um, rich in terms of uh, evidence all the papers are. So um, it, it, it's quite um, a treat uh, for me to comment on these papers. Um, and so I will um, start with uh, just a very broad remark about um, where we are now in the field of um, rebel governance. And I think that um, your papers really much reflect um, the state of this uh, field within the field that was uh, pioneered by uh, people in the room and um, Anna as well. And um, what I found like super interesting is that, well, um, perhaps 10, 15 years ago, the main uh, question was about the nature of uh, wartime orders and uh, what uh, shapes them. And uh, you sort of uh, complexified the field by uh, exploring the different ramifications um, of uh, how uh, wartime orders, for example, shaped the post-conflict, but also on how um, uh, rebels during wartime like deal with specific situations uh, such as uh, uh, COVID or uh, climate change. So, um, super beautiful addition to uh, the field. Um, I'm now moving to uh, specific comments on each of the papers, and then I will uh, end with a big remark for all of you and uh, all of you in the room too, um, which reflects a concern I have with um, this uh, rebel governance literature. So starting with the paper by uh, Chauvin, um, I, I, I've been like... Um, super stimulated by um, the, the, uh, the description you make of the um, um, different um, responses um, uh, by the armed groups captured by the, uh, the, the papers. I, um, I'm going to focus my comments mostly on Nigeria, which is uh, the uh, um, uh, case study that I know better. Also, I may ask why you think that the comparison between Colombia and Nigeria is in fact useful. I mean, that's something that might be worth um, 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 uh, detailing a bit before uh, sharing the, the findings, actually. And um, my main concern uh, is about um, the conceptualization you offer of the crisis. So you're talking about climate change, you're talking about COVID. And in fact, we may want to um, analytically um, identify better um, the impacts of these different crises, like the temporality uh, and also the spatial dimension of these two crises are in fact quite different. And you may expect different responses, perhaps de depending on uh, the nature of the crisis that um, hits the place where uh, rebels are uh, active. So I think there's uh, some work to do perhaps uh, around the conceptualization of um, crisis uh, themselves. Um, and their uh, heterogeneity, uh, leading to different uh, effects. Now, when it comes to northern Nigeria, I'm not sure we should um, necessarily be um, convinced with what people say about uh, the recruitment processes in relation with crises such as uh, climate change, which in the case of Northern Nigeria is a super complex crisis. Uh, it's not clear whether um, it's more rainfall or more desertification, um, if the lake is shrinking or expanding. In fact, there's a lot of controversy around the actual impact on uh, livelihoods of climate change uh, in the case of um, the lake Chad, uh, Chad uh, 
uh, area. So um, asking people whether they know people who joined the armed group as a result of difficulties encountered that are linked to uh, climate change, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a kind of a stretch, right? Um, it's hard to conclude from uh, the answers whether or not uh, climate change has an actual effect uh, on um, recruitment. Now, uh, on the COVID side of things, um, beyond um, what uh, Shekau has uh, declared uh, about um, COVID uh, being uh, something um, 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 like mostly attached to um, the uh, kufars uh, and um, that good Muslims should not wear uh, masks, um, we have little evidence about um, in fact, the behaviors of the armed groups in the areas they control uh, with respect to um, the COVID crisis uh, itself. And um, evidence about northern Nigeria and uh, from the areas controlled by the uh, um, groups is in fact very, very thin and, and, and there's not so much that uh, we know. So it's hard to, to make uh, conclusions um, about um, like how armed groups actually behave uh, in these zones. So that would be my challenge for you, uh, Shaban. Uh, moving to um, Martha's paper, um, I, I found the, the paper extremely like, um, carefully thought um, and with very neat arguments uh, and nice categorizations of um, observations and um, evidence. Um, uh, perhaps uh, since you have many different mechanisms at work, I um, may ask how you manage eventually to identify like each causal mechanism like and uh, whether the um, evidence uh, allows you to conclude about the uh, superiority of uh, one mechanism over um, an, uh, another. Uh, what I found also um, extremely um, valid and interesting and which um, uh, connects with a, a broader finding, I think, in the governance uh, literature and rebel governance literature is that whenever armed groups are challenged, then the military imperatives tend to uh, supersede any other concerns and whatever you do in terms of rebel governance tends to be undermined, eroded, because you channel all the resources uh, for the protection of the armed groups and the military uh, operations. Now, the big question I would have for you, uh, Marta, is um, how you think the different armed groups and the Houthi case is super intriguing, how they uh, construct the, the, the threat and how um, they engage with science, in fact. So I was wondering uh, whether you captured some narrative discourses that uh, portray uh, the COVID crisis in a certain uh, way um, and whether a constructivist approach of the threat uh, would be useful at all for your uh, research. Moving to Anna's uh, paper and uh, Anna's and in fact other uh, authors. Um, um, my main question is in fact about the original intuition which you based uh, in the literature and which is a literature I don't know necessarily very, very well, but which I don't find so uh, intuitive. In fact, you could argue that when you are exposed to arbitrariness and violence, um, there's a demand for rule of law, like you want to get rid of this uh, violence and uh, uh, arbitrariness that surrounds you and uh, demand for um, a stable um, uh, uh, environment that rule of law could um, foster and, and, and promote. Um, and um, so I, I was in a way surprised by the direction that uh, the, the, the paper uh, takes, um, even though um, it's based on uh, uh, literature. Um, a second point that I was interested in is the connections you make between like uh, preferences and experience. So it seems that for you, the uh, preferences derive from what you've been through, right? Which is very, very valid, but it, preferences are also shaped by narrative discourses, things that come from uh, very, very far away, uh, and that may uh, eventually affect uh, the way you see the uh, rule of law. And maybe in the past, um, 
the uh, people you've interviewed like have been in touch with a form of rule of law that they were not happy with. So um, the definition of the rule of law uh, itself might, might be questionable because it might connect with previous uh, experience. Perhaps it's just a degraded way of uh, Western type or liberal democracy that people were not um, happy with because it would not uh, deliver justice to them, for example. These are my questions for you, uh, Anna. Um, and eventually, uh, Marine, I think the, the um, uh, paper like is super rich, uh, perhaps uh, overly complicated uh, analytically. Um, my, my sort of spontaneous re reaction when I try to summarize the main argument is, okay, whether what matters eventually is whether elite survives or not. And maybe it's just a binary story that uh, m may be told as a way to simplify uh, what looks like a very, very uh, complicated argument. And I have two questions for you. Is there a difference that you make between civil war recurrence and processes of escalation and de-escalation within the same conflict. Uh, in the case of the Tuareg, for example, you could claim that there are like four Tuareg rebellions in Mali. In fact, it might be just the same war happening since uh, 1963. Um, so, uh, analytically, is there um, a difference that you establish uh, here? And um, a second point that could be problematic is that um, you don't seem to differentiate between the wartime experience and how the war ends specifically. So the war ends uh, in a way that uh, see um, a loser and a winner uh, emerge, but that may, or what eventually emerges as winners or, 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 or losers might not necessarily reflect the experience of uh, wartime. For example, in a period of occupation by an armed group, like all sorts of transformations may, might have happened, but it's not necessarily the case that this group that uh, introduced changes and that made people leave something else uh, eventually uh, end up as winners. So maybe there's something to differentiate between the wartime experience itself and how the war ends and the type of settlements that emerge after uh, the war. And I will finish with a broad question for all of you uh, that um, uh, concerns the way we engage with history in the field of rebel governance. Um, we, it's interesting that uh, we now have projects about legacies of conflict, and legacies of conflict are um, studied uh, through wartime uh, experiences. So you tend, to, uh, there's a tendency in the field to explain what you see by what immediately preceded, right? That's the way we engage with uh, history. And similarly, uh, what we do on wartime uh, governance, uh, is generally shaped by pre-war uh, institutions. Um, my feeling is that it's a sort of very mechanistic way of engaging hist with history. And what we may uh, miss here, and I know that some of you have engaged with these issues, is the issue of endogeneity, uh, the kind of wartime governance that we see emerge in some places um, might be uh, the direct product of um, uh, history and um, how you create an order might, uh, 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 and might be uh, caused by um, uh, situations that uh, pre-existed before. And in fact, the wartime order is just one small sequence of a longer uh, history that may require you to go back in time and quite far away in time to uh, make sense of um, all these uh, observations. Also, we can change the past by changing the narratives about the past. And what we see now is a lot of uh, falsification of history or reviving of uh, old things that may explain um, what we observe during uh, wartime. And I think this is sort of loop here between the past and the present that we miss when we study uh, things sequentially, or like one thing after uh, the um, other. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a big methodological question uh, for uh, all of uh, you and all of us, I think, which I think, uh, I think remains um, unanswered uh, in the field of um, rebel governance. Thank you very much again uh, for your fantastic presentations. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, on that very thorough and uh, good work on the papers. Uh, for the interest of squeezing in uh, a couple of audience questions as well, I would invite 
those who have questions, and I can see so many hands already. <laughs> so let's uh, start from, from here. Uh, please keep them short. Yeah, sure. Uh, Oli Ruhamäki, senior fellow from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Really fascinating uh, set of uh, papers. Maybe just <laughs> comments uh, on Marta. Uh, your paper, I mean, the concept of governance, I mean, you, you have a sort of a you talk about security provision and judiciary, that's like the minimalist uh, approach, and then you have the groups that have also service provision, which is a more maximalist approach, you know, Hamas, Hezbollah, Taliban, what have you. So, um, yeah, just maybe it's m maybe more a comment than a question that we, we have this. Uh, I just liked your uh, continuum, that's the point. But that links to Anna's uh, paper, and that's I'm slightly challenging the idea that, um, <coughs> you know, rule of law, as we understand, is sort of <coughs> the universal thing. And this is actually one of the things that we published today in this paper, uh, Understanding Non-State uh, Armed Groups, that we, we put out with, with, with two colleagues at, at FIA. And that the point here is that uh, we premise our thinking on, in, in the West at least, uh, on the Weberian notion of institution building. And my experience, I have thir uh, 30 uh, years, uh, three decades of, of experience working in conflict settings, ranging from Cambodia, Afghanistan, Palestine, Iraq, and so forth. And I'm just wondering, I mean, uh, isn't it the fact that often it is the exactly the judiciary and the security provision that many of these uh, rebel groups, insurgents, what you, whatever you want to call, that, that resonates among the local populations? and hence their clout also. So I'm just wondering, you know, we're, we're, we've been pushing the sort of rule of law agenda. I used to work with the UN myself, so <laughs> uh, down the throats of many populations. I'm, I'm being provocative here. And I don't see the results. They, they doesn't look very good on the ground. So I'm just challenging the notion that we are we're having this uh, Weberian notion of institution building that it doesn't seem to fly but um, maybe you have comments on that. Thanks. Hi, Adam Day. This microphone doesn't seem to be working, but that's fine. You can hear me. Um, from UN University. I have a question for Anna, which has to do with the specificity of the Colombian context. It seems like the war in Colombia is largely driven by a quite a legal framework that disenfranchised the land tenure and the, the solution to the Colombian uh, conflict was also quite legal. You've got the land, the Victims Restitution and Land Act. There's a very high awareness of the legal framework versus other conflicts. Like when I work in Eastern Congo and South Sudan, most people don't see much of a legal framework to either the, the conflict or the solution. And I guess my question is, do you think that your findings about that are that are fairly counterintuitive in some respects about the Colombian experience might actually not be easily extrapolated to to other conflicts where actually the reference points in the law and are are, are non-existent for most people um, uh, dealing with the conflict let's have one more question uh, well if uh, they are very quick one uh, so uh, let's have these two questions from there Hi, thanks. Uh, ben Lessing from University of Chicago. Just for Anna also, you know, I maybe it went by or maybe I didn't follow it that well, but it sounded almost like whatever the rebels did, you know, whether they were violent or whether they controlled violence, either way, the same prediction or something like that. I couldn't quite tell. So maybe you could, that, I think this goes to Yvonne's comments as well about what, what's really the hypothetical prediction. And then the last question there. Thank you. Uh, so I'll keep it short. Uh, Town Dirks, University of Basel. Um, I have two questions. One for Anna, uh, which is about uh, the rule of law. So in my view, if you ask people, do you want rule of law, uh, anyone will say yes. But it, no, yep. So I wanted to ask you if you could specify how you uh, operationalize this in the survey that you did. Um, and then for uh, the work on Ethiopia and Somalia, I was wondering, um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Christopher Clapham. Um, he, he claims in, in, in his publications that 
the pre-existing state bureaucracy in Ethiopia was perhaps one of the reasons why uh, the EPRDF uh, managed a more or less stable transition. Um, so I wonder if, you, yeah, how you how you see that point. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, so let's cover the brain twisting amount of questions, comments, and insights. So let's uh, proceed in the order that you spoke. So uh, uh, please, if you start. Thank you. I'll keep it short because I think most of the questions were to my um, fellow panel members. But just maybe, Ivan, in response to some of the things you brought up, I, I don't disagree. Um, these really weren't designed to be case studies to compare anything across them. It's just these are the places we're doing work. And I should have probably said up front, you know, this project is really to have practical implications on the ground. It's to support practitioners who are trying to run reintegration and DDR programs. They're trying to be more effective. They want to build peace in these different um, these different places. It's also areas where we have access to ex-combatants. So it's, it's driven a bit by that. But I, I do take your point there. And I think you raise a really important thing to inform further work in this space, which is about how we ask about questions related to climate change. Because people don't necessarily experience them as climate change. They just might experience, experience them as a really bad harm of 10 years. So we don't really, we have to be really careful. And we, sp we, we spent a lot of time thinking about that and we try not to ever use the term climate change, but I think it's a really good point for how you craft questions to really get at experiences. And then just maybe one point on sort of asking other people. So this is before we had access to ex-combatants themselves who are talking about um, climate change effects, even if they don't speak about them in that way. Um, and this is talking about other people and their perceptions of what's happening. And I still do think there's value there, particularly in a context like Northeast Nigeria. I think it's different, actually, in the rest of the late Chad. But because of how long reintegration is actually practically happening. I mean, almost everyone we speak to knows people personally, family, community members who have gone through this and come back. So they do have insights. And community leaders who often broker returns, they do have insights. I don't think they're perfect for getting at this, but I do think in the absence of other uh, data and access to the people themselves, it's at least its start. But I really take, I take these um, points of feedback to heart because we really want to get this to be stronger because I think we haven't made these links really yet. We're just starting to and to find the right way to do it. So thank you. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Ivan, for your comments. I really appreciated them. And uh, I find extremely interesting the point that you raised at the end about how the armed groups construct the threat, how they engage with science. For instance, when it comes to the Houthis, it was very interesting to see how uh, the group was uh, using the uh, health emergency, the virus, to uh, strengthen some points of its uh, ideological manifesto, of its propaganda, accusing the United States, accusing uh, Israel, uh, rejecting uh, PPEs that were brought by um, humanitarian organizations, saying that um, they were ineffective and potentially harmful. So it's really interesting to adopt this constructivist approach that you were suggesting to see how uh, the group and the ideology of the group might, might really become another factor that affects the approach to the emergency. So thank you for this uh, insightful comment. Thank you, Ivan, for the comments. Just uh, briefly, so you, and I think this connects to another question. So you started your comment saying that you find sort of the this assumption kind of not making a lot of sense. That's in part where the paper starts, right? So we are not we are not trying to develop hypotheses to say, oh, this they should be right. We are saying there is this big assumption. Let's do our best effort to think theoretically how it would work if it is correct, right? And so I agree with you that it's not clear how a human being responds to experiencing arbitrariness, authoritarian rule. It may go different ways. Based on the literature we have on support for the rule of law, it is true that you would expect a lot of these experiences to undermine support for the rule of law. But the next step, of course, is to think about what is the process of preference formation and maybe under what conditions would people go for one reaction or the other, and that's where we want to go, right? So this is a first paper to sort of open a research agenda saying this assumption that you do see in a lot of policy debates and in a lot of research where we assume there is this democratic deficit, this may not be right, right? or may not be true. Um, and, and your last point, I think it's true, you know, endogeneity, and just when we study legacies, there are so many issues. One is 
pre-existing factors, but another one is that a lot of things are happening at the same time. I think a lot of the work on legacy focuses on violence, but a lot of other things are happening, and it's really hard to disentangle them. And so when in the next stage when we are trying to really think about legacies on political behavior, I think we really need to theorize very carefully if there are things that are in the past that are explaining rebel governance, whether they could also explain what you see uh, after the end of the war in terms of political behavior. And then, um, um, so I agree with your comments that, um, uh, well, uh, we don't know, I don't know if uh, interventions or policies to improve the rule of law is what we need. And that's precisely the point of the paper, saying we assume we do, we want to help our research community and policymakers to investigate whether that is the case. So we are not saying the opposite, right? We are actually questioning that. Um, the Colombian case, is that, uh, is that going to generalize? I'm not sure, and, and I, I, I think I am ignorant still about how these processes shape political preferences and beliefs, and that's why um, I think we need a, a research agenda on this, and the, the, where we unpack more of these mechanisms. Um, I, I do think Colombia is particular for a number of reasons, but I also think that, especially for conflicts that have ended recently, a lot of people have been exposed to this talk of, of similar sort of normative values that may shape also what they think they, they want or what they think they sh have to tell a, a, an enumerator, for example. And, and these are things that we need um, to consider. Uh, ben, your question, so it, it's both. Uh, and it's not our hypothesis, like saying, oh, this, this should be true. It's us really engaging with different literatures to try to anticipate. So the, be, the way in which we operationalize this, and this answers the last question, is um, exactly, and I just have it here, uh, in order to capture criminals, is it desirable that authorities on occasions break the law? Which is something that a lot of people would say yes in Latin America, right? And so building on that literature, we expect people who have endured violence to support less the rule of law, right? But then we were trying to think, okay, maybe it's not just if they endured violence, but also whether, whether an armed actor was able to curb crime. And so what we measure here is whether um, you may have lived under the governance of an armed actor, but you may be very conscious about how good the armed actor was in reducing crime. And, and in my field work, this was very, very often the case. People were really happy that no one would take, would steal or rape someone in their community. That doesn't mean the group didn't commit acts of violence, right? It's different, and you could have both. You could have a community where there were massacres and homicides by the group, but where crime was zero, right? And so we are developing these two different hypotheses. And interestingly, we, we find that none of these make people want their mayor to um, break the law in order to curb crime. So I'll stop there, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the comments, and thank you very much for your question. And I think your, uh, I'll explain, but I think your question about Christopher Clapham's work actually speaks to the challenges of um, grounding the study of rebel governance in history and the endogeneity of rebel governance. So the argument is in the Horn of Africa, you have highland and lowland society, and these two types of society have extremely different tradition of the state dating back to centuries ago. Um, and, and I think there is some truth to the fact that this um, uh, long run tradition of the state influenced both uh, the forms of rebel governance and the stability of the, um, of the post-conflict government. But at the same time, I think there is a little bit of a risk of not only overemphasizing this argument about the tradition of the state, but also sort of like essentializing political culture as if it was static, never changing. Um, there's one way to look at this question, which is there is a Somali province in Ethiopia um, that is this, like, uh, that borders uh, Somalia, and so um, maybe like one day maybe I, I'll get to do that. But if you compare the government, like so when the TPLF came to power, it started to extend its governance system to the Somali region of uh, Ethiopia, and so I think it's it's um, it tells us that like. Political culture has some explanatory power, but not, um, but doesn't explain everything in the sense of like the Somali province of Ethiopia is not ruled at the same, like isn't governed by the same governance system as uh, um, so Somalia. Like it's, it, it shows that the Somali co political culture does not preclude administration by institutions that are independent from the 
plan system. Um, so um, I hope this answers some of your question. And then uh, um, thanks so much for the comments. I very much agree with your point about how, when do you decide when it's like one conflict or several conflict and when do you decide when you have achieved stability. I don't know yet, which is why the quantitative part is still a work in progress. 